Great. Thanks a lot, George. And thanks for inviting me to, uh, to give this talk. Um, I'm glad we've sorted the tech out. So, um, yeah, um, what I wanted to do today is, is uh, talk about uh, what I call what is called media scores. Um, and it's and it's how also how new technologies have specifically affected how we think about music notation some of the historical background of it and show you some examples of how that has manifested itself in my own work um so i've called the presentation media scores um and it's a term that i began using because it could include many practices including graphic scores video scores audio interactive or generative approaches to to the score and i'll, I'll explain later what these uh, could be so to begin with uh, we can ask the question what is the role of score and notation in traditional classical music one could argue that the score has the double function of both organizing musical ideas preserving them uh, and through publishers, of course, distributing them and eventually making money out of them. However, as we have finally moved from the Gutenberg era of printed press to the dig digital age, what actually remains of the role of the traditional score? Preservation of musical ideas has moved from paper to various recorded mediums, such as the record, the tape, CD, and now, of course, the cloud. Uh, so what is left of organizing musical ideas on paper? The traditional score is afforded an increasing complexity in how musical ideas can be organized, the apex of which could be said to have been the new complexity, com uh, uh, the new complexity compositions of the last century. Th this pushed the limits of what could be expressed in a linear form with the conventions of Western musical notation. So highly trained musicians at the limits of their virtuosity, devoted to the realization of the imagination of the composer. Uh, we see here a score of Fernieha, of course. What does that say about the social structures that engenders these relationships? So I'll move on to the next slide now. So, uh, this is a book by Jacques Attali. He's a French cultural philosopher and he writes in Noise, a book, a book published in the 70s. Music is all too often only a disguise for the monologue of power. What he means to show is how the socio-economic structures underpinning the practice of classical music is rooted in hierarchical structures that are all too often apparent in the relationship between composer, score, musicians, audience, and the infrastructure that supports it. Uh, now move to the next slide. The score sits in the middle of this chain of production but it also acts like a screen between the musicians and the audience, a secret text, a graphic language that is translated into sound by the musicians. One could argue that this relationship works in a time when music or music alone was prioritized as the ultimate form of expression, namely in the 18th and 19th centuries. But does this work as an art form in an age which is so visual such as ours? Uh, next slide. Uh, the possibilities of new technology affords us the opportunity to realign these relationships. It also gives composers and musicians new tools to go beyond static and linear forms of musical organization. So at the twilight of print technology, will we see the end of paper composition and something else coming in its place? So uh, the basis for these kind of works that I'll be talking about lie in different disciplines from the previous century, namely open form scores or open scores, graphic notation, animated scores, visual music, interactive scores, and generative music. To give a sense how these practices has informed the development of new media scores, I'll, I'll briefly touch on each one of these. So to begin with, uh, Though then it was never really originally referred to as open scores, the term has recently come to be applied to many works of the American experimental tradition from the 1960s and beyond, where there's, there is a high level of so-called indeterminacy, John Cage's preferred term, an interpretation needed by the performer. 
These can refer to open form works by Cage or Earl Brown, but also to works that utilize various media to construct the musical work. So uh, in the next slide, we see uh, an interesting example showing the limits of paper technology. Pushing the boundaries in, uh, into another is John Cage's variation series. These are mostly graphic or text-based works, which allow the performers to create their own scores with specific guidelines. By using transparent sheets in these pieces, especially the first uh, three, uh, first three, four uh, of these works, he tries to bring another dimension, as it were, to the linear score. So in one example, if we look at variation number one in, in the next slide. So variation number one from 1958. The musician has to construct the score from a series of transparent sheets of squares, lines and dots by dropping perpendiculars, literally, thro literally throwing them onto a surface, measuring them, and translating the data into musical parameters. Obviously, the construction of the score in Variations 1 has to be done before the performance, um, although one, of course, could incorporate this as part of the performance itself. This piece, like the rest of the Variation series, does not qualify as a graphic score in that there are specific guidelines about how the elements are to be measured and interpreted. What's fascinating about the series, specifically Variations 1 to 4, and also a related piece, the one you see in the in the slide, cartridge music, is that Cage not only utilizes abstract graphic elements printed on transparent sheets, but that the musical output is largely dependent on the user physically manipulating the materiality of the score. Cage has managed here to make a fixed medium, namely the print, behave in a fluid way. Examining the piece from vantage point of the 21st century, one could observe that Cage was perhaps trying to dematerialize the medium of paper years before digital media managed it. The transparencies could be taken as a sign of the dissolution of fixity. So the first uh, video, uh, you've, you've, we've seen it quite a number of times now without the sound, but uh, it's an extract from a film performance of cartridge music by the Langham Research Center. It's a, it's a group of uh, uh, based in England. The beauty of a score like this is that though it refers very specifically to the technology of the record player, the cartridge of, uh, of the record stylus, uh, each generation uh, that reinterprets this piece can interpret it in their own way, utilizing the technologies or instruments at their disposal. So we'll just play the video now, it's just a one minute clip of it. Many of these types of so-called open scores not only require an openness from the role of the performer, but also a certain understanding about how each piece should be approached. There is not one style, technique, or perspective that would encompass all of these types of works. Terms such as improvisation, which Cage himself did not find appropriate, could be a misleading term. In that, the context and terms of the composition need to be understood by the player and not simply played with free expression. Even works such as Edges, 1968, by Christian Wolff, written for the improvised music collective AMM, which instructs musicians to interpret a set of signs as limits or points that can be reached but not exploited, avoided the term improvisation. The graphic score uses images um, 
shapes and pictures instead of notes. Composers use graphic scores because they allow them to express musical ideas that could not be described by traditional notation. Cornelius Cardu, also uh, a member of AMM, uh, known for the graphic score treatise, writes that a musical notation that looks beautiful is not a beautiful notation because it is not the function of a notation to look beautiful, which is quite a statement from the composer of probably the most beautiful of graphic scores here above uh, treatise from uh, 63 to 67. Another composer often working with graphics deriving from traditional notation is Silvano Busotti. This kind of notation, like Cardio's, created enigmas or problems that the musician has to solve in a creative way. It seems to be speaking the same language as music notation, but it breaks all the rules. Uh, and to, now move to the next slide. Uh, other types of graphic score might include photographs rather than drawings or graphics. This is an example of uh, Anea Lockwood's Jitterbug. In Jitterbug, uh, so I wrote, I see that the name is written wrong, it's Anea, uh, not Anne. In Jitterbug uh, 2007, the musicians are interpreting photographs of rocks as graphic scores. A pre-recorded sound score draws on aquatic insects recorded in Montana. So uh, if we play the audio for this, um, this is a recording of my group Mays playing this piece, just to give an idea. Following on in the tradition of open and graphic scores, animated scores became more prevalent at the turn of the 21st century. Um, composer R Ryan Ross Smith defined it as any score that contains perceptibly dynamic characteristics that are essential to the symbolic representation of the compositional idea. So here in the next slide, uh, we, we can see a piece of uh, Ryan Ross Smith. It's um, his work as well as that by Icelandic group Slatur developed this approach in animated scores that contained so-called dynamic scoring that features perceptible contact and intersection between elements in a notational fashion. Yeah, so this this score doesn't have a sound. It's just we see just these kind of graphic elements moving. And there's a set of instructions how this relates how these boxes um, which like encircle these kind of uh, lines and dots can be interpreted by the musicians okay if we move on to the next slide uh, another pioneer of this work is cat hope with her group decibel they explore the possibilities of animated scores she defines the term screen score that can be one or more photographic images, film, or a GUI, graphic user interface, usually put into motion by way of software on a computer. Many of these scores are not necessarily intended to be shown to the audience, but to the musician only, in, which in her case is, is the case. This is partly because the graphic element in combination with sound result could force the listener to experience the music in too prescriptive way constantly comparing the notation with the sonic result rather than listening in a more undirected, freer way.
from the perspective of the visual arts, there's been a fascination, perhaps from the beginning of the 20th century, most notably in the work of Kandinsky, translation of sounds or music into visual form. His pre-war friendship with composer Arnold Schoenberg could be said to be an inspiration in this, as was his idea of creating dynamic color to sound correlations that he documented in his, in his On the Spiritual in Art. So this tradition um, extended uh, into the early film era and it tried to find visual analogs for sounds, including famous works from the 1920s and beyond by Hans Richter, Oscar Fischinger, Len Lai, and later Norman McLaren. In this example by Norman McLaren, Dots, he uses shapes on the optical film soundtrack to translate something of their form into sound. Other interesting examples of the cross between the visual art world and improvised music are the, are the video scores of Christine Markley, of course. Screenplay uh, is an example where found film footage is combined with graphic animation to create a visual score that is interpreted by improvising musicians. He writes, this projected musical score is made from carefully edited black and white images overlaid with brightly colored computer animated graphics, reminiscent of the dots and lines of traditional music notation. These visual cues suggest emotion, energy, rhythm, pitch, volume, and duration to the musicians. Although no instrumentation is specified, the score is meant for a small ensemble. So Christian Markley, just to say, comes from a more improvised music world. Yeah, we can play this video. Um, and he often works with improvised musicians, so uh, there's a, quite a lot given by the musicians in these uh, interpretations. <laughs> Have interactive scores and so-called real-time composition enabled by computer algorithms that can work on both a generative and interactive form affords a completely new way of approaching notation and unfixing fixed media. There are examples of composers using the live input from musicians, choices or analysis of sound to navigate the score space, so-called interactive scores. Musicians are given agency within the score. So next slide, we see a nice example of this is from Anne LeBerge, composer and musician working in with Maze, this group I work with as well. Her piece Raw is a work that asks the musicians to improvise on unfinished musical material and to collectively create a work in real time as they're given ongoing random choices to make. Raw for, is a max patch actually, where each player influences the structure by sending a message to the patch at his or her own discretion. The max patch in turn chooses random combinations of players to play, suggestion for the type of music to play, and a random pre-recorded text sample that is played. So this is, uh, we see this a graphic user interface of the score here in the slide. Uh, again, this is something the audience doesn't see, but it creates a sort of network between the musicians.
Questions of then I politics. Or you get stuck. Generative art often refers to algorithmic art, uh, so algorithmic determined computer generated artwork, and synthetic media, a general term for any algorithmically generated media. Generative art refers to art that is in whole or in part has been created with the use of an autonomous system. In music, Brian Eno, of course, coined the term in reference to his work with the SSEYO's Cone software in the early 90s. He used the term generative music to describe any music that is ever different and changing, created by a system. So, uh, taking this example of generative work in the field of notation, an example could be uh, a piece of forms, this is in the next slide, uh, by Play Mode Studio, uh, it's a studio based in Spain. Forms is string quartet is a generative visual music notation driven by chance and probability. In this version of a string quartet responds to graphics that are generated through a computer algorithm. So those were the the five, in a, say, in a sense, influences um, on how media scores have developed have been developing the, in the twenty first century. Um, I want to talk a bit about now um, the, the media scores in my own work, um, and and also how I came to be interested in making media scores. Uh, my own interest in exploring these possibilities developed gradually from a general focus in multimedia work. In the 2000s, I became fascinated by what I call music text films. Uh, I wrote my PhD thesis on it. Uh, text projected on a large screen while musicians played a score, minutely synchronized with the words. Uh, what ensued was a silent, synchronized reading of the text on the music, which seemed to trigger the in individual inner voice of the audience. I was drawn to the narrative potential as well as the idea of voice as a kind of silent song. Um, so to play you an example of one of these pieces, uh, this piece called Dreams of the Blind, it's a 30 minute suite of, of five pieces for an ensemble of nine instruments, um, where dream accounts of blind people are set to music through text. So the metaphor of the blind dreamer is one that can be taken to generally represent how meaning is conveyed through different sense perceptions, both in the mind of the dreamer and how these dreams are understood by a sighted reader. Uh, there, there exists a, a kind of asymmetry in sensorial communication because while one usually associates the idea of dream narratives in terms of images, the narratives of blind dreamers are not formed by visual perception but just in their waking lives are predominantly fed by senses of touch uh, and hearing.
A problem I encountered in general with these pieces was that while the musicians were focused on the dots on the scores and the audience on words flashing on a screen, there was limited eye contact between the two groups, an asymmetry in how the ideas were being communicated between two different sets of symbols with the music in between. The question I wanted to initially address was whether the music and audience could share the same visual information Naturally, the way that the musicians and the way the audience would experience the same visual information would be slightly different. But just like in an umwelt of nature, each organism could take from it what it wanted. The trade-off is that the specialized music notation would have to make place for more open or ambiguous graphics. To compensate, there is more agency given to the musicians to create their own expressive interpretation of the material. This also changed the role of the musicians from one of interpreter to co-creator. So in the next slide, uh, this example of some of these pieces that, uh, that I've worked with a kind of uh, interactive or media score, starting with Karaoke Etudes, written in 2010 to the most recent work, uh, premiered last month, The Island Remained Silent. These pieces, um, don't form my only composi compositional activity, but I still write traditional scores and sound art. But I find myself more and more being drawn to this activity because it opens up such an interesting relationship with working with musicians in a more creative and fruitful way. Um, so I'll I'll just go briefly through some of these pieces. We don't have to hear everything. Uh, the first piece that I wrote was was karaoke etudes. Um, and, you know, uh, one of the great musical democraticizers of our time is karaoke, a form in which my first attempt at experimenting with alternative musical notations, together with text, of course, and visualizing it for the audience, took inspiration. It toys with the conventions of the medium rather than duplicates its social interaction. Nevertheless, the musical code is revealed to the listener which in my mind creates the possibility of different ways of listening and relating to the musicians. In karaoke as we know it, the audience and singer share the same score, the lyrics of the song, and are complicit in the mechanics of the performance. Another media is, uh, score is uh, created on iOS, is this piece Onirikon. It's an interactive score devised for laptops and tablets based on an early Byzantine dream interpretation book, the Book of Daniel. The score itself has two modes, one in which the player scrolls through the actual book, word for word, reads it, and one in which the words are randomly picked from the text and morphed into the next random word. 
The letters of the words are assigned to notes based on frequency charts, and the players can navigate and manipulate the speeds and sounds created by the score. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is, uh, I, I originally made the score in this platform called Processing. It's a Java-based coding platform and then converted it to an iOS app. So you can you can download this from the iOS. It's free if you have a if you have a iPhone or iPad. Um, so the letters of randomly se selected, sorry, letters of randomly selected words form uh, this text and it appears one by one superimposed on each successive word letter by letter the letters of the words are assigned to specific notes based on a fixed mapping created using letter frequency analysis so that the more common letters such as EAT are mapped onto more consonant pitch relations the least common letters Z, Q, X are mapped to more dissonant or distant pitch relations once running the score can generate a near infinite combination of letter superimpositions and permutations um, so in the next video, I'll have a video. I have, have a short demonstration of how the the, the score works. And then when I, when I let go, um, we hear it picks out a word, um, and we hear the sign. It gets translated into notes. The letters get translated into notes, and we hear sine wave of the note and this this pulsing which can also be manipulated which relates to the sort of speed of the of the movement um, so there's a simple encoding of of words to to pitches sorry letters to notes um, using a kind of frequency and then we get these kind of phrases so uh, the musicians would play these notes in a, in a kind of order um, and then repeat them and then slowly evolve them as the words evolve and, and the words change letter by letter uh, onto a new word. search it on the on the iOS uh, if you have the possibilities because then it's uh, self-explanatory what I find interesting is is you know when I wrote it I had a set of 10 guidelines or rules as how to play it um, but more and more I enjoy the idea of letting the musicians decide how to play it themselves because the results uh, in some very surprising performances um, like in the early graphic and open scores that I showed, there's a beauty when there's no right or wrong way to interpret the notation. So this piece has been played actually numerous times with, in, in different ways. Um, and I've always been surprised by you know, the, the creativity of how the musician um, interprets it.
Um, another score written in Java is trench code. Um, and here the performer is controlling the score, play, so it's playing the laptop, um, so like a conductor, as it were, responding to the musicians. Uh, it consists of three inter interactive videos which act as scores for the ensemble. So each video is based on a particular code book from the First World War. This was a, a specifically related to the com commission I, I got. Um, it's presented as a graphic form and encoded into musical material that is displayed on the video. So it's a communication system is set up amongst the ensemble that utilizes the same material as used uh, in the trenches. These are based on trench uh, code books. And the three pieces can be performed together or th uh, at the same time or, or separately. So if, if we just go through the slides here quickly, we see this is the first uh, code book that I use, the Mohot code. In the next slide, we we see how that um, translated into into text, into into the score. Um, and uh, next slide, uh, we see. So if we go to the next slide, uh, yeah, we see another code book. This is a German code book, and and again if we go to the next slide we see how visually that translated into a score material here we have um lines are being generated between different parts of the map uh which refers to um specific musical parameters that they use uh and the next score is uh, uh, english code book the bab um and that translated into, if we go to the next slide, something like this, where we have uh, lines and numbers referring to kind of orchestration of how the musicians translate that. So we can, if we go to the video, we can play a bit of this video. This was the perform first performance of the work in in uh, in Concertgebouw Brugge, Bruges, with an ensemble of. Uh, sirens and intona rumori intona rumori uh, uh, as some of you know uh, these uh, futurist instruments created by uh, um in the in italy in the beginning part of the 20th century by russulo um and uh, yeah the commission was to commer commemorate 100 years since the first world war so that's why we use this kind of military weird instrumentation Another work uh, is Trackers. This is the work I made together with our artist Konrad Smolensky, and it's a performance installation work that can last the whole day. The audience can visit the event any time and stay as long as they like. So the musician should and, and the musician starts to play before the audience comes in, um, because there's no beginning or end. So, uh, in the next slide, we see the sort of music notation that I used. It's in a form of a video that's projected from ceiling to floor. Um, and the, there's an accompanying uh, so, um, soundtrack, which is synchronized. 
And musicians follow the notation, playing the letters as they appear and finding ways to interpret the interaction between lines and symbols and using any features in the space to help this reading of the score. Objects, sounding or otherwise, may be used in the space to create situations where the interference of sound and uh, sorry, score and space is enhanced. Uh, we use a dispersed, so-called dispersed drum kit, tables and speaker installations that correspond to the number of musicians playing, uh, are positioned in a way that, that there would be no space separation between the musicians and the audience. So um, if you just go through the slides here, you see how it looked. This was in a performance in Eindhoven. Uh, and the next slide, uh, this is performance in in Warsaw that we did uh, last year. Uh, photograph is actually taken through 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 glass, so uh, you could see the the audience is really spacing out. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is. Uh, this is like a video of a performance from Amsterdam. It gives you an idea of how the lines move in the space. And the idea of how the lines moving in, in the space interfere with the objects and, and uh, how they're read by the musicians. Uh, a piece that was kind of that was written in the similar series. It's a piece called Wave Shaper, um, and it's the last part of the whole cycle, which I call the Tracker Cycle. And it comes from uh, uh, electronic music theory. It's a form of synthesis where waveform is altered or shaped to produce complex partials or higher overtones. So the piece is partly based on these sounds and partly on the idea of translating this shape from from sound to how these patterns could be uh, shaped as notes uh, on a page. Um, so starting with a single note, then a contour of notes gradually evolves. Um, so this, this idea translated into a kind of semi-visual score where the musicians have to interpret the shape of their phrases by the visu visualization of the score waves that is being shaped. So they get um, an iPad where they see these, they trigger these these videos, uh, where we hear the sound of the of the wave shaper of the of the let's say uh, the drone of, of being being shaped, and they see these uh, these notes. So they see they see a set of notes and this wave, which we they also hear, um, and they trigger these videos when they in an order when they um, come to them, and they yeah, if we play the video we can see like a, this is a performance of my group uh, playing a few years ago on the radio.
and just a couple of more pieces to, to, we're going to just briefly uh, go through them orbital uh this is a piece i wrote uh during corona um it's a journey around the ring road of amsterdam uh, the a10 um and made during the first period of lockdown and the and the score is basically these 74 images these kind of tableaus of uh, videos not images uh, in which musical parameters can be interpreted and um the general t i mean the 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 piece is made on javascript so the musicians trigger these graphic elements what, what i call kites these these white objects um and now they're triggered with uh, with audio input, so that with a kind of audio analysis of of so the musicians go to this microphone, um, they trigger these kites depending on on the sort of loudness of of what they're doing, and then the other musicians interpret these these kites. In quite a few of these later um, pieces that I'd made, the, the, I made, I create kind of melodic material or, or some kind of tonal material. And in this case, the, this piece has 16 melodies that musicians have to learn off by heart, one, you know, or just pick one melody to, to memorize. Um, and this is a way of controlling also the the harmonic sort of or melodic material in a piece This is this is a um, piece called Hands, um, and here in this piece, six players or any actually any amount of players I realize this possible respond to hand gesture movement uh, rendered on a kind of three D animation program. So the gestures control synthetic sounds that are generated from computer and moved around in a in immersive space. So the players sculpt the sound with these gestures. 
using these these uh, myo sensors. Uh, the video is projected on the floor and around the space and shared by the audience and players alike. So, so again, a bit like in trackers, I wanted to create a sort of whole space um, that the piece takes place in, that the score is, is, takes place in. So if we go to the next slide, we can sort of just see a, a, a short example of the score. And this is um, uh, the piece I wrote last month. Uh, it's called The Island Remains Silent, and it's an interactive and generative score written in Java again. Uh, the signal of one or more instruments in the ensemble is used as the conductor. Uh, in this case, it was one of the percussionists. Um, so when it crosses, the amplitude crosses over a certain threshold, a new event is triggered. Uh, which is seen by the musicians and the audience in whatever way is most appropriate. So it could be like a video, or it could be um, with with monitors, or, or or with a with a, a kind of a transparent screen projected in front of the musicians. Um, and so we have here just specific events, like we see the white notes here uh, are, are notes with lyrics, and we have the yellow. Uh, ones which are gliding notes. Uh, blue is this kind of alternating pulse, which we see. And then this red kind of figure, it generates a sort of note with a kind of uh, unspecified ornament. And then we have like this, this gray cloud, this big circle on the top right, um, which refers to this kind of more harmonic content. And then each time also every now and again a new island is generated so a different kind of island configuration is gen generated so if, we, if, um, if we go to the next slide again much like most of my media scores there's a control or specificity on the melodic content in this case the melodies are encoded in the uh, in this algorithm and they're randomly triggered depending on what island group we're, we're at um, and it's also assigned to one of eight sequences of texts um, so that each time a new song uh, in, is generated, um, it comes uh, with a sort of different configuration of lyrics. So you always get this kind of uh, new song always generated, uh, um, which is not sung, of course, it's a, it's a silent song.
and had the fortune of of working with this uh, ensemble of 19 musicians called the Future Traditions Orchestra, formed in Dresden, um, and composed of mostly non-Western instruments, uh, you know, ranging from, uh, let's say, Turkish, Syrian, Japanese, uh, Uzbek uh, instruments. Um, and what I find beautiful is that uh, because the, the main material was melodic, um, they could um, interpret it, they could ornament it in the way, you know, that related to their own traditions. Uh, so it was, very, it was really a uh, very nice experience um, and very nice interpretation of this piece. So in conclusion, I wanted to give an idea in this talk about what is possible in the coming years in terms of rethinking the conventions and practice of musical notation. Examples from my own work in this field and from many artists that have informed my own practice. Uh, this does not mean that paper music, as we can call it, is no longer relevant, far from it. But the new, new ideas about encoding and translation of musical ideas will develop in parallel to existing practices. Nobody, of course, nobody can really predict how this will develop in the future with such fast technological developments that are going on now. Uh, but hopefully artists, human or otherwise, will be there to create something uh, beautiful and meaningful out of it. Okay, thank you. That, that was the talk. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Kirakidis. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and we already have a question from... Uh, okay, okay, great, sorry. I, should we yeah. dive straight into a question? Zohan, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, hi. <laughs> hi, hi, hi. Yeah, I really, really love your example. So, so you mentioned in the future there will be new technology coming out. So right now we have virtual reality or, or and yeah. augmented reality. How would you project yourself using such new technology of uh, doing your music, uh, composing your music? Because this is dimensionally different. Is this still a yeah. word? Yeah. yeah. So it became from 2D to enter world to 3D so the performer can enter in. Yeah, really, it's a good, good. In, in, in different dimensions to uh, experience the uh, notation. So, just my question: How would you use this of this kind of deal? Yeah, I think I think both. I think I. I it's funny because I I myself have not done anything really with with those technologies, but I I have a student who just made a piece uh, using a kind of VR situation where he projected scores in a kind of Google. Uh, Google Map uh, virtual like three D view sort of situation, uh, and I know other people. I mean, th th that have done this, and what what it affords you is also the possibility of of um, of engaging the audience in a different way. You know, like with a kind of more immersive uh, situation. But I think, yeah, I think th these are really interesting uh, technologies to to explore, also specifically with notation. Uh, and and how how we can use this you know this idea of like the kind of media scores within a within a um, this kind of virtual space or augmented space as you say yeah no do you, do you know people who've, who've worked in that way? Um, uh, yeah, I have a friend uh, used uh, Blender, so as a uh, gone, so the he wear a really. Uh, our glasses, so the plan, the the shape will put uh, the kind of, some kind of image will project on the gons things like so the yeah, yeah. on the position things that like I'm not sure so yeah so yeah, that's no. why so and uh, yeah this this kind of difference of pose things like that, yeah okay so are there any other questions 
Um, I wonder if there are some people that are putting questions in the chat. Uh, no, not yet. No. Okay. Cool. Ah, I, I use, I use English Chinese. Ah, to tell you, ah, to tell you, is if you want to ask a teacher a question, but you are afraid to speak English, then you can put it in the chat and then I can translate it and then I can translate it. Ah, okay. So, ah, uh, yeah, I have. I I want to ask you, or I want to share、yes. a, a reflection I have, um, and and get your. Thoughts on it because I think it's pertinent to your your topic.、Mm -hmm. um, because you're talking, you talk today、um, mainly about the way you notate pieces and and sort of、yeah. new ways of notating pieces. But I think this connects intimately to the technologies for producing the sound, which you're employing、yeah. as well. And, and in a way, they're interconnected; they're inseparable.、Um, and it made it made me reflect upon. The fact that if you take an example like a like the forte piano, nowadays there are almost no forte pianos anywhere, and almost no one plays them because、yeah. it was almost completely supplanted by the piano forte. So、yeah. I wonder if,、um, to some extent, nowadays, if sound producing technologies are su slowly supplanting traditional sound producing technologies. Such、yeah. As instruments, and、um, how would that affect the future of notation、um, or the future of music making? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a really good point. I think it has to do with with、um, physicality of of these instruments. You could say, like like how I mean, because. Because even I mean, like in in some of these scores that I showed, like some of my scores, let's say sound is generated by the score itself、uh, as well. But、um, when I think of like like say、um, ele like electronic musicians, you know, there there is a certain、uh, agency in the musician to generate these these sounds, with, with, you know, with with new instruments or with non traditional instruments, let's say. So、um, I think. Um, the way we generate sound in the future,、um, you know, the question is how much how much agency will there be to the performer? Like, for instance, will we will we need performers to do it? Or、um, I think I think for, for a lot of music, yes, we will still want to have、um, the sort of connection that with with a person, you know.、Uh, um, You know, like、um, what's the word?、Uh, uh, engaging with a kind of with, with a kind of physical material thing, you know, that that can generate the sound. Uh, but uh, you see, yeah, I mean, you're right to point out that in the you know in the last twenty, thirty, forty, fifty years,、uh, most of our musical、um, consumption has taken place in with this kind of invisible. Sound. Either the sound has been pre-recorded, or as is the case now, it's a kind of electronic,、uh, digital instrument. So,、um, yeah, and you're absolutely right to say that questions the whole idea of what is the notation use useful for. You know, that,、uh, that's why sometimes、uh, I like to extend the definition of notation or the definition of a not notation a score. Um, into just a network, a system, a system that's created that 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 doesn't necessarily have to be between a musician and the composer's idea, but it could be also between, uh, uh, you know, the score itself and the audience. So there's a sort of interaction that is、um, defined as a score, you know, and then maybe the、uh, the the guy who made the previous. Comment about the virtual reality. <clears throat> I think the thing about augmented reality and virtual reality is that it puts the it puts the audience, the the participant,、uh, much more directly engaged with the op art object itself. So without the interface of a performer,、uh, so that changes also the 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 rules. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think、uh, now nowadays the vast majority of music, as you say, is experienced in a mediated way rather than、yeah. a kind of direct 
way. And uh, there was an interesting example I encountered of this recently, um, a young student um, who's just finishing high school. I, I sent her a, a recording of, um, a live recording of a mass, which I'd written for four part choir. And she, she was really excited. She phoned me up and said, what app did you use to make this? <laughs> it didn't even occur to her that it was, uh, real singers doing it because she 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 just she she thought it was it couldn't possibly be real musicians doing it because in her mind the uh, music that sounds good and sounds tidy and polished and you know uh, for her is music produced electronically or in a, a mediated fashion. Yeah, yeah. funny. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, Ricardo's put his hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan. This was uh, hey, thanks, really, uh, interesting, interesting talk. I uh, have two two uh, quick uh, comments and uh, maybe a question. Uh, one is about uh, you. You very well presented the the connection, the interaction between audio and visual. The the you starting from the idea of score. Actually, the score is not anymore something that we translate in a pure audio, uh, audio uh, and uh, auditory stuff, but the score go as a system, a network to, to something that uh, really uh, appear in, in the performance itself and be became part of a, of a unique idea so um that's that's uh, th this is really something that interesting to me how the the visual part uh, can empower and enhance uh, the 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 auditory the poor auditory part and uh, that was a comment and uh, also because uh, i'm very much interested in this uh, the gestalt psychology of uh, visual forms oh yeah and, of course yeah, yeah and i imagine yeah. imagine there is something that you somehow translate uh, or uh, try to 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 work with space and time in the both modality the, the visual and in uh, 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 auditory so this was the first comment and i don't know if you have something on that the second one is but this is a just a curiosity how uh what is your perspective on uh, artificial intelligence in this in this kind of composition this kind of composition yeah thank you yeah yeah no that thanks ricardo yeah that's true you uh, like knowing your research as well like the fir the first uh comment um it's interesting how how what kind of visual uh information visual forms relate to what kind of sound uh ideas and i think um it's not actually it's not something that i've really thought deeply uh consciously about i think it's more like kind of a subconscious thing but what i have to say is um i'm often split between a kind of graphic language that that, that uh is more um related to how a musician might interpret things and and to how an audience might interpret things and i've never i i, I personally don't like um situations that are two one-on-one -on -one so that the audience has to really um it, it illustrate in a visual form what is happening in the music so i like a sort of sense of uh ambiguity or poetry or something that is not totally clear uh just to leave that space for imagination so 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 not too literal interpretation of graphics i think that's that's one thing that i often think about um but uh, the, the 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 second point about ai it's funny because because also i was asked to write a, a a little article on ai and the future of music and ai i just really i feel out of my depth you know like many of us is like things move so quickly that i just don't know i just really um I, you know of course i i enjoy working with algorithmic uh material you know so so this idea of creating a you know something generative using an algorithm uh i would say in a very basic way like and 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 i've made another piece with a uh, with um with Darien Brito, a uh, co colleague of mine, we, we made a kind of much more sophisticated AI piece 
let's say using kind of more sophisticated algorithms uh recently um but uh i yeah i find it very difficult to to know where it can go you know like it's it's uh yeah. you know and whether i mean there's something exciting about it but there's also something um at the moment i i feel as though all the stuff i've seen um in how ai is used in a in a more commercial sense it's very it's not so interesting for us because it has to do with replicating you know these yeah. existing uh data sort of sets and okay it's it's kind of it's funny it's cute how you can you know uh through a kind of text describe something that the computer could do. It doesn't do it so well with sound obviously with images and text it, it uh does it quite well now you know like in, we can have surprising results with sound you know you know copying some existing type of music is not that interesting even though we can marvel at how a machine can do this of course um so but i'm sure the the next steps in in this kind of creative uh boost will come you know within a few years so like yeah, it's yeah. you know whatever we say it's going to be outdated i think yeah, yeah. thank you yeah. okay who else um would like to make a comment or ask a question Oh, I, I just uh, by the way, I just want to ask Yanis: Would would it be yeah. okay if we shared the um, the Google Drive folder that you? Oh yeah, good idea. Yeah, when yeah. You, up, you uploaded all the all the media for this lecture into a drive. So oh yeah, we can share. Do I have to do that, or can you do that? Uh... Um, well, I think uh, I think I downloaded it all and put it back. In okay. There loaded it into another drive so this is the drive which i made okay oh yeah yeah gladly because then you can yeah. watch the the films properly like yeah yeah so <laughs> yeah so everyone i want to encourage everyone to to be sure to go and uh have a look at the the films in the proper frame rate so um so you can all get the sense of how the the text uh and the images uh, match up with the sounds um so yeah very sorry about the technical issues. no 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 worries yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay gonna have to have a, I, an inquiry about what ha what went wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i'm very interested in the the piece um which which uses a stone as a score ah uh, yeah an air yeah. lockwood yeah yeah um so we we i mean like she's been she, she's a really interesting uh composer She's in her 80s now, actually, uh, Anaya Lockwood. Um, she was one of the, uh, came out of, the, uh, you could say, a kind of fluxus type uh, uh, music practice in the in the 60s, uh, where she was like, she had a piece where she was burning pianos and playing in a kind of glass um, container. Um, to in the last 30 years 40 years really working with uh environmental practice so really a lot of field recording uh work and creating scores from materials that she from from things that she finds in her in her walks in her um environments that, that she's recording so um so in this in this particular piece i played she has certain rules about how a musician follows these kind of veins of stones inside the stone um but the you know and 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 it's really meant as as kind of duets you play duets with with people but there's also this very prominent sound uh sound recording field recording from the from the these river uh, areas that she's recording in so the musicians also in some way interact with the soundscape as well as the the score so it's a very it's a very beautiful piece um which uh and in a way you could say this this idea of using a stone as a score um has this very strong symbolic aspect you know um that the musician has to somehow internalize you know it's not it's not so much about uh 
you know what you know how do i you know how do i follow this vein and what do i change pitch do i change but it really has to do with internalizing this idea of what am i doing as a musician reading a stone you know and the, the kind of uh most kind of philosophical implication of that i think yeah so that's mm -hmm. just a bug isn't it that one just a bug yeah. yeah yeah so everyone can go and um be sure to listen to the audio which yeah you weren't yeah play. i mean we 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 made a we rec we um, my group just made a last year made a cd of two of her pieces uh, Jitterbug and this other piece called By You Born, which is a piece she wrote for her good friend uh, Pauline Oliveros, who died also two years ago. Um, not also, she died two years ago. Anea is still alive, of course. Um, and um, so you can find that on Spotify and iTunes, I think, on Bandcamp. Uh, um, but uh, yeah. So. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to ask a question? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think I think that's probably that probably wraps it up. So, yeah. Sorry, we went over time for this. Oh well, that's fine. No, it was it was um, it was fascinating material. So thank you again very uh, very much to uh, Yanis. It was Kudin. a pleasure. Thanks, thanks, thank you, George, for inviting me today. It was a pleasure to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, uh, well, yeah, I mean, everyone has to go and listen to the the audio and watch the videos and and you know see them in their as in in, in the best quality possible. Uh, so, because I really want I really want everyone to be able to get a, a true sense of what you're doing in those pieces. So, thank you for a really interesting, fascinating, and varied talk. And it's given us lots of uh, interesting and new ways of thinking about music and notation. So, thank you very much. Thanks, George. Thank you. Uh, and so that uh, so that draws today's symposium to a close. Thank you, everyone who uh, to those of you who stuck through it all the way from nine in the morning to now and uh, thank you to those of you who joined in the afternoon for the english sessions um and just to let you know that the the symposium still has two events left uh, there are two composer forums happening at the start of june so look out for advertisements about that uh, so th this year's symposium has four composers we we chose four pieces um which uh, to be featured in the symposium. And uh, we've invited the composers to present on their pieces at the start of June. So that will be the 2nd of June and the 9th of June uh, in, um, in the evening, 7 p.m. in the evening Taipei time. So I'll, I'll, I'll make some posters and, and let everybody know about that. Okay, so thank you very much again. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to Yanis and goodbye.